Get through the lecture. Okay. Great. So let's uh, put this stuff on. Um, you're not going to so yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. I'm, I'm going to make you take the test anytime just to have you here. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Aaron, I'll let you hear Aaron will probably talk to some other people. Starts at 11 30 sharp on Wednesday, 75 minutes. Should be a lot of fun and entertaining. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm officer at 1 to 2 today and not tomorrow. If you have questions, we have a piano also. Anything that's unclear, but the term is why the future of the universe. Yeah. How much material do you think will be on network security and sort of the stuff we've covered that like, hasn't been on the home? Do I think? Yeah. <laughs> will there be a question on? Um, there might be some. So everything is included, including today's lecture. I want to say. It's closed books. So it's kind of the same. We're paying attention to that. So you do the homework. Um, more than anything else. So there might be questions about network security, about web security, about these recent topics, all the way through like lecture one. Or, yes? Well, there'd be stuff that like, might have been mentioned in the book or in the previous year's lectures, but not in this year's. Like, I think you mentioned like ASCII armoring. Right. Um, well, we mentioned ASCII armoring in this class. Yeah, we did. Yeah. What is ASCII armoring? See? Everybody knows. Yeah, you put null pads in the ellipsis. Why? Why? Because it ends a string. It ends a string, so I can't copy too many ellipsis addresses together because there's a null pad in them. That's SDR yeah, right? yeah. And what, how do we circumvent SDR array? Oh, you have access to strings. Yeah, or use anything that the program is actually, any string function or any library function that the program actually uses. Ends up with a, an entry in the PLP, program link statement, which has no null bytes. So it's all it does is you jump to it, is that it jumps into the correct loop theater. Ah, so jump into PLP. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So, yeah, now you know. Yeah. Now this computer in the exam is great. Okay, good. What else can we put in there? Yeah. Any more questions? Nice hand up there in the back. And this can make multiple rounds as needed. <laughs> <laughs> So it converges. Great, okay. So, um, yeah, so there should be a, a new lab coming up soon about uh, web security. So you get uh, hands on exploitation fun. Uh, and I'm hoping there might be actually more than one different lab because we're, we're actually building one that I want to show you about SQL injection. So I'm actually then soliciting your feedback on the questions and the text and so forth. But, well, more about that when we actually have something concrete on that. So, yes? How much, did, how much detail do we need to remember like, in the homework? Like, a lot of things, we just look at the uh, instructions, uh, what is alphanumeric share code, something like that. You don't have to remember an alphanumeric share code for the for the show. <laughs> yeah, that would be a little bit torturous. Uh, I would, might put in there just to kind of see. No, but, uh, uh, what do you have to remember? I mean, you have to be able to be a little bit of a GDP yourself. Like, I might show you a GDP session and be like, what's next? Or what's going on? What's what's happening? Uh, so do we need to like remember some very important instruction like EBAT or something like that? EBAT. I'm not going to quiz you on that, but you kind of have to have some sense for what's what is in the shell code. Like what's it look like? What do we do with the things that we do? Like you saw in the practice exam, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be just like fill in the missing hex values from the shell code. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's true. It's missing EF. Yeah. Um, you should not always find the end off, but a little bit like that, right? I, I'm not here just to kind of torture you guys. It's kind of more like testing your skills and all that sort of thing, right? No really here. <laughs> I'm aspiring to not torture you. Yeah? <laughs> See? Good. Cool. More questions? Cool. Okay. So let's uh, resume where we were last time. Anybody remember what we were talking about last time? Don't say DNS resolver because it doesn't parse. Seriously?
これからそれとなるとあれです。<笑>フェンシングインターネット。Source port. Ooh, so we're bound to that source port. That's very interesting. So, all these different places here are getting、uh, requests here on port 53 with different transaction IDs over here. So, what were we doing? Remember, archaeology? We're trying to attack DNS. Because if we can attack DNS, we can create things like jargonkin.com without paying for jargon.com. Right? We can、uh, make Bank of America point to us, our website. Be like, look, I'm Bank of America, please prevent our pin. Right? We can do all this cool stuff. Yes? Cool, as in like scary. Okay?、Um, so, here's the idea we're going to ask, we're going to poison the local DNS. How are we going to do it? We're going to send a message to this unsuspecting target DNS server called 132.34.50. It's a local DNS server here. And、um, we're going to spoof packages. Remember what spoofing was? What spoofing? It was like, well, too much current you know. <laughs> Anybody spoofing? Pretending to be something else. Yes. How do you that in the network context? What is a spoof packet? It's been a long time, guys. It's been four days. <laughs> If I send a TCP packet or any type of packet and I pretend that my, the source address of this packet is not me, I'm spoofing a packet. Right now, this hacker is saying, like, hey, actually, there's this random person over here with the third seven who's saying, hey, what's. Oh, sorry. This isn't even spoof. This is just the hacker saying, we don't have to spoof yet. Um, this local DNS server is going to ask their upstream DNS server for every single request that we sent to it hey, 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 what's in this.is? Or whatever it is that's spoofing. Now we spoof. Now we say, hey, actually, it's just going to respond from your upstream DNS server. You're going to, you, you change the source thing, this red thing here, to be 8888 and whatever ID that you want to have in the packet. And you say, hey, actually, the question you just asked、uh, with transaction ID 12345. The answer is、uh, let's say that i s has 66.66.66.66. I don't know. After somewhere in Kazakhstan or whatever it is. That,、right? And he does this <coughs> many, many times. Why are we doing this? What's happening here? What's the idea? So we've sent many requests to our DNS server that we're targeting. Are we trying to get one with the same ID? Yes, we want some of the IDs to match. In other words, So, with some of the IDs that get sent by the unsuspecting DNS server, which is just random 16 bit IDs, to match with some of our spoofed responses. Because if they match, what happens? Then that local DNS server will think, oh, Shindy's not i s That's 66.66.66.66. Oh, I'm going to keep that in my cache. <coughs> Now everybody's going to ask about Shindy's not i s We、we'll、get that response, right? Imagine doing that for bankofamerica.com, facebook.com, right? So far, right? Google was really weird today.、Right? <laughs> This is what we're trying to do. So, what is the probability that if I send out a bunch of these packets, that I'm going to have some maps like this? That any of these green addresses in this column is going to match any of the green things here in the 
other problem. I just did one match. What's the problem of it? Intuitively, guys. Depends on how many you send. Okay, so as a function of that number, let's say call it K or something. Intuitively, it should be high, low, medium. It's like the birthday problem. Right? Ah, yes, it is exactly so the birthday problem. Like Ninety-nine percent chance if you have like thirty people in a room, something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, and so that's for three hundred sixty-five days. Uh huh. So multiply that number by however many. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Cool. That's still the math, right? This is the, so here's, here's the, the part. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, <laughs> Nice, okay. Um, and then, oh, hacker, of course. Anyway, so can we get uh, the transaction? So this bit, just go with the attack elements to the map, right? So we system bit um, transaction IDs, and we send n queries about Sinisterias or Bank of America. It says a random transaction ID. And then we spoof another n responses as fast as we can before the upstream server can have a chance to uh, tell us what the real answer is, right? And we succeed with some response message, some query. How like this is to happen? Let's start with the birthday paradox, exactly. So, what is the birthday paradox? Anybody heard this? Yeah. Ah, uh -huh, good, yeah. So, now we're, there's 23 people in a row. How likely is it that some, let's say it's this room over here, trust the 23 people, I guess? Maybe. It's a bit of an overestimate. It used to be 23. <laughs> um, some number of people in a row. What's the probability that they share a birthday, like these similar people over here, right? Um, well, you can do the math. Uh, has anybody seen the math that's over behind it? Anybody care to see the math behind it? No. Okay. Well, what's the probability of this not happening? That you keep having people enter a room sequentially and that they just happen to have all unique birthdays, right? Well, first, the person working the, into a room certainly, certainly has a unique birthday once they enter the room. Otherwise, like, the universe is broken, right? For the next person who works in, Let's suppose that there are 365 birthdays, that could be. Well, it's going to be problematic if they happen to have exactly the same birthdays of one person in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 over 365, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're unique. But, okay, what's the other, so now the third person enters. They're going to be okay until, unless they happen to match any of the two birthdays that we have. So it's okay except in the chance of 2 or 365, right? And so forth. And once I have had, let's say, k of them, I have k minus 1 over 365, right? Now, what's a good way to evaluate this? Let's say that this, we'll call this thing here something. Uh, let's call it p. And this is p as a function of k. Okay? So, let's try to uh, estimate roughly how big this is. Because this is kind of like, oh, it's a big multiple. When we see multiples, we kind of intuitively, as mathematicians, want to change it into. Summation. So I could change this into some sort of summation here. Simplify what's in the parentheses and then pull out a one over time. Just this giant expression with like. No, what's within the parentheses. Okay, so how do you simplify this? 364 over 365. Okay, yeah, yeah, you could do that. So you can get this. Does anything cancel that you can see? Doesn't really, right? Yeah. No, because of this hairy kind of combinatorial expression. Here's a cool trick. Anybody know? Um, the Taylor expansion of e to the x, we'll say e to the minus x, perfect. Roughly? Roughly equal to <laughs> Really? <laughs> Taylor, like this is your friend from high school? He has a band. Right? Oh, <laughs> 1 minus x plus x squared over 2. No? I'll just tell you. Here comes a commandment from above. <laughs> e to the minus x is roughly equal to 1 minus x. Plus an um, x squared term that no one really cares about for small x. Okay? These look like, like 1 minus x is to me, don't they? Mm -hmm. Roughly. So it's kind of like... So instead of putting this one in here, I'm going to put, ah, uh -huh, yes, e to the 
365. And this one here is roughly due to the Oh, well, this is looking kind of interesting. Times all this stuff and e to the minus, what, k minus 1, 3, 6, 5, which is equal to, separate this stuff. Now I can do some fun stuff. What can I do? It's like saying e to the <coughs> from, k, from, k, uh, <coughs> Mm -hmm. Like the sum of all k's. Yeah, I can even take the 1365 outside. And then I want to sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3. Yeah, it's somewhere. K, oh, it's less, yeah, let's make it k. From k, 1 until how many do I want? Oh, let's make it a different index here. Let's make it up to k. And this is i, and here's i. Oh, what's this thing here? It's tattooed on some of you. It took 171 with me. Check your old tattoos. Like Roughly ish, yeah. That's right, okay. So this is k times k plus 1 divided by 2. Okay. So in other words, this whole thing here is like saying e to the minus 1 half times 1 over the number of days here times k squared-ish, right? Cool, okay, this is the probability that this will fail. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't there like a permutation that we can use to get the probability? Yeah. Which is not easier than this? You can. This is a really good approximation, mm -hmm. but you end up with combinatorial terms that are going to have 365 to the k uh, in the denominator. And then you're going to have a factorial thing on the number, and you have to evaluate it kind of mathematically. Way simpler. Okay, more questions? Okay, so what, what does this mean? So this is P here, this is saying like, what's the probability that we fail? So we really want 1 minus this, right? Okay, and then I want to know like, what should K be so that this probability is something? Right? Suppose I want probability to be 50 percent, right? One half, right? Then I'm saying, hey, I want one half to be equal to what? E to the minus one half times one over three, six, five times, let's say, k squared. How do I do stuff? We're getting close to the territory where people are familiar, right? Okay, how do we solve this? Ah, uh, yes, okay. So, what do we get exactly? Okay, so minus log of 2 and is equal to <coughs> fine. 1, 3, 6, 5. Notice the 3, 6, 5 is kind of a parameter here. So here we have k squared. Okay, we're making progress. Good, 2 times 3, 6, 5. And the minus goes away, right? Over, wait, over. Uh, over times log 2 is equal to k squared. Now we're getting very close to something you guys can solve, right? What does this mean? Let's take it a little bit more general here, okay? So here's the thing that people are asking about. You can do this kind of, get this expression that looks like this, but it's really something you have to show into a calculator to figure out what it is. But it's roughly the stuff I talked to you about. So here's the approximation in, in uh, white, and the black thing here is the actual computation of the formula. So you end up with this formula. You say, suppose it's not 365 days. Suppose it's n, what, n days. And suppose that instead of it being k, it's n k. And the formula is 1 minus e to the minus n squared over 12. Okay? In other words, if I do this same calculation over here, what do I get? If I want to isolate how many, well, uh, okay, how, do I want to isolate m or n out of this to know how many packets I need to send? 
How does this relate back to our DNS problem? N packets. Okay, what is N? 2 to 16, yeah, 65,000, right? Okay, good. So we have something like the probability here is what? 1 minus e to the minus, what? This is uh, m squared over 2n, right? And you want to isolate m out of this. So, and we want this probability to be equal to 1 half is good, like 50% probability of success. We can repeat it if needed. So we get the same thing over here. So we get the. Uh, uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. Uh, so we get one half, so E, so it's minus M squared of 2N is equal to what? Log of one half-ish, so it's one half, uh, yeah. And so now we get the minus, so this goes away, so this is log 2, so this is now M squared is equal to 2N times log 2, and then we can take the square root over here. So you end up with something that's effectively order of square root of n, right? And n here was what, 65,000? So this is what 256 is? 256 squared is 65,000. So we need about 256 packets, which is nothing. Very, very cool. Let's have a look at this in the slide beer. Probability is this thing over here. So we show up in, uh, yeah, n here is the number of packets or something else. Sorry about the terminology change there. And then 2 to the 16 is the number of possible IDs that exist here. So 3 in brackets, well, if you talk about it exactly, 50% probability of success. Think about it, yeah. So it'll work if, if your own packet matches your own packet? Like well, you're sending a packet that then triggers the DNS server for sending a bunch of packets, each and every one, and then you spoof a response. So if, if the packet sent by the DNS server and your spoofed response, if any of those match, you're good. And apparently you need only 300 to have 50% chance of success, which is insane, right? The intuition would be that, like, well, this is like 1 in 65,000, you have to send about 32,000 packets to get a match. This is what you would think, right? The conventional spoofing is, it's like, okay, it has to match exactly, so it grows really slowly here in the yellow. <laughs> but for the birthday thing, because it's any pair, the intuition there is that if you look inside a row, the probability that I hit exactly a birthday, yeah, that's pretty low. But the probability that a particular pair, any pair, there's so many pairs, there's n choose two pairs in a room, that any one of them has property, well, that's much higher. That's quadratically higher. Cool, huh? Cool. Okay. <laughs> easy, easy. Okay. So. This poisons the DNS gas. Now, this birthday stuff exists in many other uh, circumstances, uh, in crypto and so forth, for instance. So, as a consequence, you can now take your DNS files, redirect them to some malicious site, you can have your credit cards over there, and you can show you my new car. Oh, a nasty car, yeah. Um, how do you fix this? What would be a good way to fix this whole attack business? Make it so you can You can make it to bits. You have to change the protocol, though. Yeah. And that's the thing is that, like, yeah. If you take a clean slate approach to the internet, sure, yeah, you can fix the entire internet. The internet will still chug on using its own machine. Like, it doesn't pay for many places to like buy a new router because it don't, can't afford it, right? You're going to need to be dirty slate, backward compatible with what's already there. And that's what makes it tricky to deal with things on the internet. Well, how could you fix it kind of in a backward compatible fashion? Oh, how would you engineer that? How would that work? Like, how can you how can you make it so it doesn't break regular queries? The one thing you do is to randomize that source port, right? Remember how the source port was the same? If that's random, then you have two sets of IDs, right? Lens two to thirty-two, four billion. So you need about sixty-five thousand packets, right? Other birthdays. Right? Have to live. There was a time to live uh, path that people had. It's like, well, I just can't have, uh, I'm going to randomize like the time to live uh, or have it short or something. And then there was another attack in 2008 that 
invalid data all the resets and that have to be patched again. It's been a long attacks against DNS. Run with the UDP source ports like DJ Bernstein's DNS server does. You can use DNSSEC, which is effectively start to use encryption and, and validate them. This is getting more and more common now, that people are stepping like, hey, here's a cryptographic signature that I want my DNS to look like this, right? I mean, DNS curve is a elliptic curve crypto, um, um, which you can add to some of the additional fields that they have in DNS, so they can kind of self-validate yourself. Here's a really cool one. You know how you're searching for like SIN or something like that? What if the server that's asking upstream, instead of asking for sinus.is, it takes some characters and makes it uppercase, and some makes it lowercase, and it does it randomly. And then if it gets a response, it has to be echoed exactly back. Ah, more bits of entropy. Um, and yeah, this happens also in other forms of crypto. So that's um, a little bit about network security. Any questions before we hop on to the next boat, which is wireless? Question? Ooh, okay, we need more candy on the ship, okay? Here, we can make this do another round here. 250 pieces. This is the empty It's Halloween, right? <laughs> this is my trick. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, where are this hacking? So let's take a look at the question. Blah, 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 here in the US, this is a part of your wireless spectrum. This is the um, uh, part of the spectrum that you can't really visibly see. <laughs> Pretty far above that. But it's the one that you use all day, right? Even in class, sometimes we use this. Mm -hmm. So here's the uh, part of the cell phone range, CDMA. This is the old US standard that is slowly and surely and fortunately being eradicated. This is terrible. Um, for uh, data trans uh, transmissions at 450 and 800 megahertz. And here's the GSM, the more international standardized uh, thing for uh, cellular phones at 900, and actually also at 1.8 gigahertz, 1.9, and so forth. No, uh, 1.8. I thought 1.9 was both GSM and CDM, whatever. Um, whole bunch of frequencies here that have been allocated to the components for. Now we have here the 2 gigahertz range. You've probably heard about the 2.4 gigahertz, which is the unlicensed spectrum where all sorts of goodies live. Where is this all the Wi-Fi on all your laptops here, right? Or your phones that are connected by Wi-Fi. There's also a 5 gigahertz spectrum that allows you to extend some of that range so you can get more people talking together. So things like WiMAX, which is kind of it's an experimental idea, slowly incorporated into the whole wireless 80211 spectrum. And LMDS, I don't know much about. But yeah, it's a whole spectrum of fun stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about wireless security. Okay. So, let's first talk about the range of these things, right? So, you can have a little trade-off here, if you look at it, of things being fast, as in you get a lot of volume, and things having high range. Right? So, one of here, we have this near field kind of communication here, which is effectively very slow things at very small range. Why do you need that? Well, maybe a password or something like that. Right? Or don't need a lot of power. You know something that has like long range? Well, that's what these traditional cell phone towers have been optimized for, right? So you have operated frequencies so that you can not necessarily get a high data rate, but uh, you're able to talk in like obscure parts of the country or any country. And then you have the opposite happening indoors, where people are like, well, we need to be able to get those cat theaters really fast, but it's only like within the 30 meters. Or so as you walk away from your house, your Wi-Fi signal starts to pay. And somebody else is like, so don't think so. And now, of course, people kind of want to enter this territory here, where you're trying to have like 4G and 5G, is trying to do like faster stuff with higher range, so you need kind of wider spectrum for each of them, um, point to point solutions like Apple Towers, a whole bunch of things that are being thought of here. And now there's 5G, where they're trying to have really low latency, really fast stuff, but still high range, and it's all getting really crazy. Anyway. If you just take a spectrometer or a hacker app or something and just look at what's happening, you'll actually see there's a whole bunch of stuff operating on all these different frequencies. For instance, like if you turn on your microwave, it can interfere with your wireless signal, depending on what channel you have. So if you want to be the worst roommate in the world, <laughs> I'm making round in again. <laughs> so here, for instance, uh, you can see 
uh, on the x-axis, the channels, the famous like Wi-Fi channels, remember, right? There's 11 of them that have been licensed in the U.S. So okay, one, three, eleven. Of course, there's many more. It's just a part of that is like licensed to something else here in the U.S., not in the rest of the world. Um, and here you have Wi-Fi congestion. Where's your microwave is going, going nuts? Or your cordless phone, which is also in the unlicensed spectrum. Nice handoff. Um, cordless phone. Yeah, here's your microwave. <laughs> Uh, in the upper regions. Now, when you're uh, when you're trying to uh, put up a wireless access point in your home, and it doesn't work so well, chances are it's on the exact same network as something else. So you can download this thing here. It's called the Wi-Fi monitor. You can kind of see who else has wireless uh, points that's roughly the same spectrum. We'd like them to be kind of as disjointed as possible. So there's actually some bleed over between adjacent channels. So the normal thing is that you want something like 1, 6, and 11, because that's the maximum you're spanning now. Or switch over to 5 gigahertz. Or if you see that everybody's at channel 1, we'll move to channel 3, or, or, or something like that. It's a very handy way to enhance your wireless. Anyway, so suppose you're back to architecting networking like you. I know you don't remember this, but we were doing it last class for wireless networking. You're like, oh yeah, we were network architects last class. Cool. How do we now become wireless architects? How do you uh, do this? So what's different from the wireless setting from the wire, right? Yeah, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> That's not me, I hope. Um, but yeah, you want to be able to have like this weird environments where like you have weird reflections from a part of the pool and from like this kind of surface that's moving, it's like deflecting your signal or you still want to, this person still like, eh, can you do this? And I'm like, you know, like in a circumstance where I never should be able to, right? Um, range, right? That's an actual antenna. This is probably the one with um, warrant driving, which is when you drive around your car and try to hack people's wireless. It often involves you get sprinkles cast and expand the uh, the range of your of your uh, of your antenna. Can you imagine police officers should be like, oh, no, I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm just munching um, slowly. Um, and then you have this weird phenomenon where, like, for instance, I had a computer that uh, when I turned it on, there was something wrong with the driver or so forth. But when I like opened my computer, everybody else's internet went offline because uh, it was so loud. Like the, the settings were set so high, it was like it was like working at like a decibel or something crazy. Um, that like it just overwhelmed like everybody else's room. So I was just like, I want to talk to the internet, and then like to turn everything else off. We also accidentally when we were doing wireless research back in my own lab. Um, we accidentally made something that was like a garbler. Because like, we went to a convention, like we were like showing stuff off, and then everyone was like, the internet doesn't work. So I'm like, well, it works now. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that may have come up on the network kind of thing. So, if you shout really loud, yeah, maybe more people can hear you, but maybe that's not the optimal way of getting along with the internet. Right? But you have this weird problem here that you can have weird terrain, right? So. We're lucky here in the US that every, what, everything is kind of made out of like wood. It's like, oh, wood house, what a great idea. It's like wireless signal services for it. I come from a place where every single house is made of reinforced concrete. So you like, you have a wireless signal, and you walk out of the room, and it's like, oh, there's no, like, you can't even see that there was traces of the network in the next room, right? So you have like a wireless access point all over your apartment. And everybody's like, ha, 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 rains of 100 feet. <laughs> what are they talking about? And then I came here, it's like, oh, I see why. Because like, things are made of wood. Um, so you have this uh, circumstance or like situations where sometimes it might even pay to have kind of this ricocheting of packets, right? Somebody forwarding packets on your behalf. These are called ad hoc numbers for those. It's a whole active area of research. <coughs> How would you do this efficiently? And then you have this funny thing that the signal attenuates over distance. It's not that like it just linearly goes down. It's actually radius squared. So if I just like when we're talking. You can hear me, you can hear me, and then like at the back of the class, there's like, right? Like you can hear it just like you can be in like yoga kind of zone, right? Because it has a tenuity sufficient, right? And that means that like in this particular case here, B is able to hear both A and C, but they can't really hear each other. So maybe having a protocol where you would take it back on this stuff, so the information to the your messages would be useful. Now, in wireless, um, things have been organized as follows. You end up with something called infrastructure. So when you, if you've been fiddling with your wireless driver, you'll see this, this term come up. It's just called infrastructure when you have these access points 
that hook you up to the rest of the internet, or the rest of the network. Okay? So, each of these cones over here is called the base station. So if you're saying BSS ID or something like that, it stands for base station. But also, the terminology for cell phones. You're connected to a certain base station. Um, so, cell towers actually point to their own base stations. Their only purpose is that they're these wireless beacons that are uh, getting the traffic and, and kind of modulating from, from the wireless setting to the wire that's hooked up. Right? They're the translators between the wired and the wired department. So you can set your network card right now, if you like, from infrastructure mode to IPOP mode. In an network mode, you have no base station. You just have a lot of people kind of gaming or whatever it is that you do in the wireless setting. Or if you're in a place where there simply isn't any infrastructure, this is how people can coordinate. There's no leader. Everybody can kind of just jot on in and be like, I want to say stuff. You know, let's, let's exchange files. Okay? So the way it's um, translated, um, it actually looks something like this. This is 802.11, which is a standard from IEEE about how we deal with access points and how we deal with kind of our other settings at the 2.4 gigahertz range. We have what's called the base station set here, BSS. Basic services. Um, also known as the cell in the cell phone link. Right? It's all the kind of people who are talking to the same access point, the same base station. And then there's some helper switch around it that connects all these different uh, base servers and moves it up to the internet. It's a router there. Okay? <coughs> now, in that mode, well, yeah, you have a lot of interesting questions where uh, different nodes may be relaying information from each other without being a specific base station or access point. So let's think about how this works in the database. Suppose we want to make a new 802.11 network. How does it work? Oh, you have this, this Linksys router. Everybody has this Linksys router, right? Or something like it. Like, it just says, Raal, hello, join me. Raal, I have powerful signal. I'm called super secure. And of course, you're going to oh, or like secure. Like, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to connect to that. Do so you notice how, like, when you go through weird towns or something, and uh, there's too many wireless access points, some of them will be called virus? so that others won't join it. Like, don't join my network, you'll get a virus. <laughs> there was a, uh, a friend of mine who uh, was living in some, some place where a lot of people are using his open internet, and he's getting kind of annoyed at it. So instead of putting a password on it, he forced all the traffic through a proxy, and the, traffic, the, the, the uh, proxy took all images that were found on ACP and blurred them. <laughs> so the people will be like, oh, this internet sucks. Like, all the images are going to blurry. <laughs> Everything else works fine. <laughs> and, or, or put them upside down. Or just, they're having a lot of fun. Just a question, though. Anyway, so the, the packet that's sent out here for the Genesis, or the beacon, or association, as it's called, is what is the SSID? Like, what is the network that's coming up? And this is being shouted right now by all the MRE infrastructure, and maybe even some of your, your laptops are not knowing it. Um, there was a there was an IPOC network that's called Free Public Wi-Fi, and uh, it's it's still kind of going around. The way it works is that if you ever try to join Free, free Public Wi-Fi, it now adds to your Windows list of networks that you're trying to go to. And it's the default IPOC network because it's the only IPOC network you probably join. Which means that if you leave your computer open and you're not connected to any network, you're going to shout out to join Free Public Wi-Fi. So it actually spread through the world kind of like a virus. So somebody just started like free public Wi-Fi and everybody started to join, then in turn infects others, and now there's like a lot of computers that think they're part of free public Wi-Fi. Of course there was never any free public Wi-Fi. So it's good to be true, didn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, you send up this beacon over here, so it's here. Here's the MAC address of that router. Ah, MAC address, remember? Yes, yes. You need to get the power of a number card. And uh, some information do I encrypt or not? Right? And then these devices that uh, stock images from the internet, they're all like, oh, yeah, 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 that sounds great. Let's totally join up and be like, I want to associate. And like, boom, you have a wireless v a double lab. Like, uh, you have a, a wireless lab. This is your basic service set here. And then once they've joined, then you can start to authenticate and do all these different things that you want to do. Give them IP addresses through DHCP, yada, yada. So here's the, the program we talked about before. Here's just like a snapshot of somebody's Oh, we're like, you're here and you, like, you happen to be close to a McDonald's, which is probably not a McDonald's, but close enough. Um, all this default Comcast wireless and so forth, right? 
I can see that everybody has a default configuration. These are all the network system on channel number one. They all have terrible connection because of this. Uh, same thing here for default 11. You know what I'm so the way it's divided, so the 2.4 gigahertz range, which is uh, reserved for Ava 211, it's divided into 11 channels. And these are the channels that I've closed here. As you can see, there are actually 13 of them. But in the US, there are only two levels. Spinal tap. Um, the question now is, given this information, how would you go ahead and share the bandwidth? The bandwidth being some subset of the wireless spectrum. If you were engineering wireless right now, what would you do? We didn't get another job? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't give up, right? Right? <laughs> Got it. Okay? How about you? So who is talking when? What, why? Like, how, how do we do this? Why don't we share this each and every band here among all the people who want to talk to the one access point? Suppose there's like one access point in here, maybe? Uh, yeah, right there. This guy here is an access point. And all these computers over here are trying to talk to this access point. They're all in a particular channel, like channel one or something like that. And uh, they're all kind of shouting at the same time. There's no way for me to discern who's talking. It's like all of the people could be talking together and I can't hear anything. How would you make it so that we can somehow share the bandwidth of like, channel number one? Hmm? You could queue them up and each, uh, sequentially. But you need to somehow have a protocol in place that like, how do you queue up if you can't hear? Because everybody's talking at the same time, right? It's kind of like when I ask you guys questions. You're all talking at the same time, <laughs> right? <laughs> You see? Identify. Identify. Probably want to somehow moderate it, right? You talk right up. He's talking, right? Or he's talking. That person is talking, right? Would be good, right? But somehow I have to make sure you're doing the wrong job and they're taking turns. Now that would be that would be nice if I knew who it is that is connected to my that's the service set, so I can, like, do you have anything to say? Oh, okay. Um, you can go ahead and download your movie, right? What if, what if we went through every single person in the room, most of whom are just completely idle right now, and that one person is getting a movie, it's just like waiting for their turn, right? That doesn't sound so good. So we could, instead of it being kind of dictatorial from the wireless point, we could have it more like, I, I, I want to I talk, can I talk, can I talk? Okay? Let's see how it's done, right? So what we have is an amalgam of like years of engineering called share band carrier sends multiple access. CSMA. I'm gonna drown you in acronyms today. Ha 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 ha. right? Um, so we're not just dividing the frequency. What we could do is that we could say like, okay, we're gonna divide the frequency up and you're gonna have slightly different frequencies. But we're also dividing up the time. And then we're also doing some fun stuff here with code, so we can encode transmissions together. Don't worry about it. Roughly speaking, this is how it works. The access point says, um, well, this is a collision avoidance over here, which is that these guys are like, I really want to talk. Right? Catherine says, like, I really, like, really want to talk, and Derek's like, no, no, I don't want to talk. Sorry, Derek. You're right here. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, we both are trying to talk, so, so here's Here's uh, Catherine, here's, here's, here's Derek, and they're like, I want to talk to them, please, please, can I talk, right? And like, I can't hear anything as an access point. I'm like, ah, la, 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 you guys have to kind of settle it. So I'm just going to say that nothing happened here. What will happen is that both Catherine and Derek are going to realize that they weren't hurt. Right? Like, I want to be hurt. So what they're going to do is they're actually going to randomly back off. Now, this, of course, doesn't happen in no normal social circumstances. But in the progress of the um, of wireless, you back off probabilistic. You're like, okay, well, there are too many people talking, I'm just going to wait a little. So, Gavin might send a request to speak, RTS. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Request to, to, to uh, send. Um, and that could be heard by the access point. 
And that's supposed to be like, oh yeah, Catherine wants to speak. Let's have Catherine speak. Sends that to everybody. Clear to send. CPS. And then Catherine can be like, well, there's like this one time, blah, 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 blah. You can have like a model, like whatever it is that she wants to say, right? And then once that data frame is done, I was able to just like, thank you, child. Thank you for sharing. I'll send an acknowledgement. And then uh, we move back to the first part. Or there, it's not like, okay, now can I please talk? Right? And then I might hear that be like, speak, my son. And then you'll transmit your data and so forth. Right? This is how we share the band here, right? This is called collision avoidance. It's kind of like what TCP is trying to do with this in a wireless setting where things can, people can talk at the same time. Questions about this? Yeah. So is there a kind of like a, a line to the request? So if someone sends request first, like how do you know who that's down? That's a great question. There's a lot of nuance to this stuff, but yeah, there could be like, a, we need to run Robin, and we need to let the people who are trying to authenticate speak, or well, how long should this frame here be relative to who you are, what you're trying to do? There's a lot of those types of parameters. They relate to quality of service. But in general, this is kind of the fundamental purpose, that you kind of have people just try to, if they have something to say, they'll try to speak up and raise their hand. And this is the hand raising part. Make sense? Cool, okay. So, now we also want to make this protocol somewhat backwards compatible. Remember, we have this whole internet thing that people are using. And we want to somehow connect to that thing using our wireless, our cool wireless protocols. How do we piggyback on as much as possible for our user? What is the internet? Remember, you have all these like layers? It's like an ogre. Uh -huh. wow. <laughs> okay. So, we have the application protocol, we have the transfer protocol, we have the network protocol, we have the loop protocol. Like, where do we want to be, right? Do we want to replace the transfer protocol with our new stuff? Why, why not? Maybe transfer is completely different now, right? It means we have to rewrite everything below it, right? And it would be nice if we could use things that kind of work and are compatible like we have people, right? We kind of want to just take over the lowest possible layer that we can, right? So we take over kind of the link layer. It's like the physical layer slash link layer, because the link's a little bit different when you're talking and everybody can kind of hear you. So, the other two eleven link layer, which is false. So, Normally, if you're connected over a wired cable, you're talking Ethernet. This is the one where we kind of have the same circumstance where there's a, there's a wire and a lot of people can be speaking at the same time. Be like, I want to send, oh, oh, sorry, I want to, I want to send a packet. Oh, okay, I'm going to send a packet. Oh, I've just sent a packet. Right? That's kind of what Ethernet chatter looks like. Okay? Um, instead, we're going to break it down. So normally it has an Ethernet header and has an IP and TCP header, whatever else is in the packet, and then a trailer. We want to somehow encapsulate very similar information in this Ethernet, just with all the stuff we need for wireless. So what is the information one might need in a wireless set? What do we need in Ethernet? We need to say, like, hey, I am this guy, and I'll talk to that guy over there. Right? I am this machine, and I want to talk to the router. Or I'm the router, and I'll talk to the Remember? So in wireless, is that enough? Could we just be, hi, I'm Derek's wireless card. Um, I want to talk to the wireless router. Why, why not? Right, we need some like, extra information somewhere, like about encryption, because not everything is an open network. We also are going to take an approach where instead of looking at this guy up there, this, this wireless node over there, as being kind of a, a special router, all it's going to be is an access point, meaning that it's just going to seamlessly translate information between what we're saying here in the room wirelessly and whatever router is connected to that. It's just going to be this transparent in the here. Okay? So what we'll need to do is to know what my MAC address is on my laptop, the MAC address of the router I want to talk to, but then I also need to specify the MAC address of the wireless gateway that I'm talking to. Because what if another one picks it up? Right? What if the one in the next classroom is like, oh, you're talking to me? You're talking to me? Right? 
Is it also going to route a packet to the same router, maybe? That's not good. So we need three addresses. So let's see. Three addresses. So a packet's going to look like this. You're going to have the MAC address of the wireless host, the, uh, the access point itself. So this guy over here, whom we're trying to address. And then the information about source and destination. Like, hey, here's the, uh, the person who's sending it. Hey, this is my, my, the wireless adapter on my, my laptop. And I want to talk to this, this router that's attached to the access point. That's what it's contained. And then we have a whole bunch of other stuff. We have like frame control, like what is the current wireless frame that we're in. Um, the sequence number, just in case we want to do some retransmission of just the wireless frames themselves. Um, there's another address there. It's actually used only for ad hoc networks. So relay. I mean, like, I'm sending it on behalf of someone else through this relay. And then more, there's a four other components. Then there's the payload. And finally, CRC. This is a cyclic redundancy checksum, I think. Now, it just says, hey, here's the checksum for the packet. Like, if you add up all this stuff and you do these calculations, the number you should end up with, if you cut all the bits correctly, is this. That's kind of important in wireless settings where, like, Anything can interfere with wireless. We were doing these experiments, and uh, um, if you modify anything, like if you add in a wall, you move it, you get more kind of jitter and stuff. Um, a wind affected uh, the wireless signal. Temperature affected the wireless signal. Like anything in the world affected the wireless signal. The point where we just gave up on the current experiment. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which you could have like. You send out a transmission and it just bounces off the wall in the right place and you get an extra bit flip. So a whole bunch of things that are done to try to make this a good time. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about what's inside the packet. How does it look like when we, when we physically deal with it? Here's this wireless uh, node over here, this laptop. It's trying to talk to the access point and it has the MAC address of itself, that's H1. It has the MAC address of the router it's trying to talk to, as well as the access point that's supposed to act as the medium. The immediate. Okay? This is an 802.11 Wi Fi frame. Ta da! I don't know what that is. Like in the next part, you'd be like, so, have you heard about 802.11 <laughs> Wi Fi frames? <laughs> Let me tell you. And then, yeah, we will take over the discussion. It'll be great. Um, now, what's nice about this is that all that this access point guy, this little thing over there, all it has to do now is to just trim off this part, and you kind of have an Ethernet thing. You have to do very minimal processing to change this stuff that we just designed into the old Ethernet stuff that they can send over in the cable. And the room is like, oh, that looks like a, a packet. And it just says that, oh, the destination was the router, just like before. And the source address, well, it's whoever that is. Now, the router has actually no idea that the person they're talking to is connected through wireless Internet. They don't have to, because that access point over here is responsible for beaming it across the wave, right? Now that's changing it from 802.11 Wi-Fi to 802.3 Ethernet. Wow. 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 That's it's cool engineering, right? Mm hmm Yeah. I know you're thinking this. Um, I'll thank them on your behalf. <laughs> so this dies over here every time, huh? It's fine. <laughs> You're not compelled. Um, yeah, so what else is here? The frame sequence number, just sort of light up all, uh, uh, access control. Now in this first part here, the frame control stuff, there's a whole bunch of little information. And some of that is going to become important in the next bunch Is this being sent to an access point? Is it being sent from an access point? Oh, unlike wires, we don't have any kind of directionality. There's just waves propagating, we can hear them, be like, oh, that's back. oh, I sent them. <laughs> Right? <laughs> this is kind of important, right? Was it fragmented more? Was it a retry because some, somebody turned on a microwave? Um, is there power management? Is it like my computer that's really loud? Or, or is there actual power management going in here? Was it encrypted? Uh, so forth, right? So let's have a look at um, Yeah, so this is just more is it acknowledgement, request the center. Let's talk about the security of this stuff. Now we've introduced a wireless protocol. Notice how it was engineered. How cognizant were they of security? Was there even a design criterion when this was designed? No, it never is. 
It's always like, oh, let's patch it on as hindsight. Like, oh, we'll start, oh, we should have done it from the beginning. Well, like everything else, this is broken from a security standpoint. Well, let's break it. Right? So what's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can pretend to be anyone else in the vicinity. And boy, do we do that. Right? What else can we do? Yeah, so we can, uh, we can hinder communications like, la la la, it's my microwave ramen noodles. Like, we can just kind of shake down anyone. Like, just like park your child microwave inside a company. Like, <laughs> uh, you can hijack connections. You can just like, oh, okay. So Derek is talking, and I'd be like, oh, actually, blah, 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 blah and just take over the connection. Because there's nothing that prevents me from just imitating his Mac address. Um, you can modify it. Yeah, add stuff to it. Be like, you actually want to sign up for a subscription of men's buddies. Right? Just add it to the connection. It's fine. Um, you can pretend to be whoever you want, scooping, uh, whatever you want. Right? There's effectively no security measures being taken right now. The only thing that we saw that was security related in, what, in the previous slides was. Encryption, yeah. So there was some that could be like, maybe we should encrypt stuff because it's in the open, okay? So how could we enhance security? Anything? Well, yeah, we can try that. Let me talk to you a little bit about a security concept, general security concept. It's the triple A concept. Mm -hmm. Authentication, which I'm sure you've seen, and then authorization and access code. You've seen these words anywhere there? Anybody have any idea what they mean, really? It sounds like this complicated words that the military uses anyway. <laughs> Whatever. So what they mean is that authentication means that you want to convince yourself that this user is who they say they are. Right? Somebody goes in and be like, my name is Reza. Reza, yes. Right? And then you want to somehow get more um, confidence that this is indeed Reza, right? Now, what would be an example of trying to do that? Show me your ID. Show me your ID, yeah. At, like, uh, at the gas station, going, oh, yeah, where actually is it? Or what are we doing in computers? Passwords, right? We ask for something that I think only that user would know, and that we would also know, right? Something that we have in common. Like, well, when Reza created this, this account, we set up a password. Do you remember what it was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you said you can have a pen, smart card, you can have a two-factor authentication, and all sorts of stuff. And authentication by itself is usually either yes or no. I've authenticated you because you answered my questions to, uh, to the extent that I'm convinced that I think you were you, or you're not. Right? Authorization. What, what is this? That is, how do we establish that? What Reza can do, or is allowed to do, or should do. Right? Now, yeah, we authenticated them. Oh, yeah, just go, go nuts. Like, you read any file, right? Yeah. So we have these, like, is it an administrator, customer, is this person on a free trial? Like, what's going on here, student? Oh. Uh, so we have these concepts so that are very kind of intersecting, but slightly different about groups, and roles, and privileges, and permissions. Now you're into the whole military kind of, uh, the economy of, of, of what it means. Like, do you have permission to do this? Well, do you have the privileges to do that? <laughs> and those are suddenly there. So we can say that you're in the group that's allowed to access these files, um, as long as your role is also that of an administrator. Um, and then you can have extra privileges to open these files or create these things, or that's okay. And then there's access control, which is how do we make sure that only those that are authorized can access certain now, this sounds pretty familiar with all the stuff we've been breaking for the semester, right? We broke this in a way that we talk to these random programs and then we overflow them. So in a sense, all of a sudden, we have the same privileges as those programs. Even though we never authenticated as administrator, we have an administrator access if we add back a binary out by root, right? So we've broken the access control. So normally, access control involves things like check to see if you are actually authenticated. And sometimes that it just gets forgotten because that's what web programming is like. Or it's um, making sure that you indeed have permissions for the file that you open and so on. Right? Make sense? This is the triple A concept. So let's see how this fits into our whole wireless picture. We have this thing called WEP. Anybody remember WEP? 
So why are the equivalent privacy? You can see how ambitious they were in terms of security. They're like, well, it sucks about as much as wired security. What should we call it? Well, like wired equivalent privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Very high bar, right? So optionally, we can authenticate users unless they just don't want to use encryption. This is fine. Everything is on the open. Open access. And uh, the second thing we're also going to try to do, instead of just authenticating, we're going to try to encrypt every packet. How would we do that? So, unless you want an open network, we're going to have to somehow share a key. Right? If you think about encryption, I can't just like, oh, I've encrypted the packet. And you're like, how do I decrypt it? Like, oh, that's up to you. <laughs> it's almost there needs to be a shared information between us, right? And the way they put it is just like, well, just like take your refrigerator at home and type in a password that everybody who opens the fridge, who also has access to your wireless network, can uh, type into the computers and then, yeah, that's good. Right? Perfect, right? Or use the phone number of the person who obviously uses this network. What a great security, right? And you're like, oh, it's my neighbor. I know his number. I wonder what his wireless password is. Uh -huh. Yep. Now, later, and this is deferred for this, you should have some sort of key management, being like, I can revoke a key, or I can have an uplink key, or well, there can be some hierarchy uh, around how the keys are done. But right now, what we're trying to do is just hard code keys into that. Into that. Now, of course, it's been a while since WAP was um, defined, and at the time, you couldn't export cryptography, so you used the wooden piece of all encryption, 64 bit RFC4. This is actually Ron's cipher. Ron from uh, uh, RSA, Ron Andrews. This is oh, I'm going to read the little cipher. That oh, was just this crypto leak. That's it. Um, 64 bits, which is something you can like break in like on your calculator, right? It's, yeah. Uh, later, it was extended to 128 bit web. We'll talk about that. So, how does authentication work with web? Suppose we have the shared key. What do we need to do? I want to know that you know my shared key. How do we do that? The shared key is hamster. <laughs> because I'm so creative, I was looking at a hamster when I made the password. <laughs> right? I just thought I didn't have any dictionary. Oh, wait. Okay, how do we know that you know my secret password? You're authenticated to my RS network. I'm the router. I'm like, ah, oh, but do you know the password? Melon for hamster. Do you just say, hamster? Like, ah, oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, come in, right? What's wrong with that? Anybody listening? Yeah, you're shouting it out in the open. So you'll have to just put a little stuff and be like, hamster. Like, okay, then I'll attach with that. So that clearly doesn't really work, huh? How would we improve on that? This is the first idea. It's like, let's put hamster directly in the packet. Be like, yeah, that's the password. Like, oh, great, cool. Accept. That's important in this case. Uh, do you think that this is encryption But you can encrypt it, but the thing is that you still need some common ground between the two parties that are trying to have an encrypted communication. And this is the start of that. So you can't just encrypt, you could maybe take a pass over it as long as you know that the other person is going to do a pass over in the same exact way, which is kind of equivalent to a different process called hash. You've taken your hamster, you shred it into a pancake, and then you like deliver that as part of your packet. And then the other person's like, oh, that looks like, oh, yeah. It's kind of like what happens when I take my hamster and shred it into a pancake. It looks the same, right? <laughs> same hatch, right? Don't try this at home, kid. <laughs> so yeah, you can hash it, right? Like, this is sniffing packets, yes. I was being very poetic here. Um, so, uh, we're not there yet. Okay, so we can hash it. But uh, how would you break that? So now, when you turn it authentic, you're like, my password is, which is the hash of the hamster, apparently, right? So you're like, oh, when I take the word hamster, and I have to get, great, okay. Suppose you're a hacker. How would you get into my world network? You just see the secret. You just hear, like, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know the password, right? That's it. It's simple. You're just passing the hash, is what it's called in the, the literature, right? So what can we do better than that? 
By the way, that's how Windows security worked for a very long time. We're like, oh, you know the hash? Great, welcome. It's administered <laughs> privileges, okay? Right? Tokens, yes, exactly. Client says like, hey, I have a number here. My number is five, because that's how good my random number generator is. Five. <laughs> and when I take five and the hamster, it makes a sound. <laughs> right? And then you send that sound. And then like the, the, the server is like, oh, interesting. OK, let me take that number, five, and, and hamster. And <laughs> OK, cool, yeah, it makes the same sound. It's cool, yeah, you're, 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 you're good, right? And then somebody else would pick a different number, right? What's wrong with this? Wait, what's wrong with what? Wait, so the hacker, the hacker can't be five as well? Yeah, of course the hacker can just pick five as well. We haven't done anything, right? Like, I also chose five. And it was all that. <laughs> oh, cool. Welcome. Right? So how do we fix this? We're almost there, though. We can hide this time. Hide with time, yeah. But what if it's taking a long time to authenticate? What if you have different clocks that diverge, right? Well, it's like, well, your time center's off, you can't authenticate, you can't get the new time because you can't authenticate. <laughs> right? That's very draconian. But a number it's like the Kafka esque number. reality. It's like, yeah, I can't put Cat 22 right over. What's that? Uh, we can take numbers on the server. Like the server. Oh, you just get the timestamp as part of the package, you mean? Well, or you could just have the server tell you a number. That can, doesn't have to be timestamp. It could be timestamp. It's probably tied to a timestamp because yeah. it's running on generate. But it's like, I give you the number 703. Now, shred your hamster and tell me what comes out, right? So you have to take that number. That's not a unique number. You haven't heard it before, probably. And you take your hamster and you try to make a whatever sound it is that you make out of that. And that has to match whatever the server is saying. Oh, now we're, in, now we're actually, we found this on sync. Yeah, so this is the instant replay thing that we do. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We're saying, hey, sending back what's called a nonce or a token. Um, so like, hey, I want to authenticate. Yeah, well, here's the random number. Okay, I'll take a hash of that number and the key and send it back to the exit point. And if it matches what the server knows, it's the hash of that same number and the key. Except, perfect, right? Now, this is what? So you guys have recreated. <laughs> the protocol of people use more islands for a very long time. Okay. Um, so it's also called the four-step challenge response authentication. So there's challenge and there's a response to the challenge. The challenge is a number that's some kind of free thing, right? And yeah, you don't have to disclose the static key and you can't pass the hash. So it's perfect. Now let's talk about the encryption part a little bit. So how does that work? The basics are as follows. So here's Eve again. Eve, of course, wants to know everything that you're saying. Okay, so you're here, you're like, ah, here's Alice, trying to talk to Bob. It just, in a sense, they're trying to have their, their, their encrypted communication, and, and there's a ciphertext going back and forth. And the ciphertext is the one that's being encrypted by the key. And then, uh, and this is what you hear, and then Bob decrypts it using the same key that you now have kind of, you've established that you both know the key, uh, and then just like decrypts it in this system. So this is a scenario right here, right? Ideally, we would like to encrypt our communication with a very, very, very long key. Now, what would that be? How do we do encryption with a key? Do you take the key, hamster, and you just, uh, okay, I have a really long string I want to send. Hamster, 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 hamster. Is that your key? Please tell me that's not your encryption. Yeah, you're kind of, yeah, you can, you can use your key but you're kind of in trouble if you keep repeating it. You're kind of in trouble if you're running out of bias. How do you get more bias to encrypt it deeply? Okay. You see the problem? No. Ideally, if you want to do perfect encryption, you would have this giant book with like the, the both of us share in common that has like pages and pages and pages of just random bias. One day. Yeah, it's, oh, it's not a dictionary, it's just like a, 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 a stream, effectively. So now look, like, it's the beginning of the stream, so it's like this this part here of that book over here that I have, and then the others have to have the same set of Okay, I'm going to XOR every single part of the stream with what comes next in this book, right? That would be perfect. In fact, it would be provably perfect. It also involves you having the longest book in the world, somehow, in both locations at once. How did you get it there, right? It's extremely impractical. The one-time pad. 
Instead, people have scaled back their security a little bit. They're willing to accept things being a little bit unsafe by having a shorter key, I feel like not too short, and then just kind of generating random things and using that to actually the threat. Does that make sense? So we have a key, but there's some process that allows us to generate new things from that key that is identical between Alice and Bob. No? Yes? Maybe? Okay. So, what we do, so we take some key here, let's say it's dirt, because it's a good key. See, so I'm sure it's a hamster. We move it to a similar render of a generator. This is our seed for the generator. And we get a stream size for back. So it's just a series of characters that this key is being ready to generate, just like a random number generator. Right? And if I put something else in here, like, oh, I thought the key was black then you get a totally different stream of effect, right? Now, both parties, Alice and Bob, know that the key is dirt or hamster, whatever it is. So if they put in the same thing as this sort of random generator, they're going to get the same deterministic sequence back. And that is how they will encrypt the messages, right? Yes? Yes? Wait, so Alice, both Alice and Bob have a copy of the pseudo random number generator? They're, no, they have the same key. And they know which pseudo random generator they're going to be using. It's just a, a function. And they but put then, in the key, and they get a stream of things back. So then I could potentially just get the key, and if I can use someone to do a random number generator, it's not safe at all. Pseudo-random generator is just a little C program or something that anybody knows how it's created for web. It's called RC4. You can implement it yourself. The only thing that you need is the key. And what? Why can't I get the key? Because at some point, well, it's going to have to turn about, about the key. Well, they didn't. They just kind of thought they knew about it because they said, like, if I take this number 1703 and I hash my key, I get this hash. And it's like, oh, it's a red hash. Yeah, yeah, you're authenticated. You still kept the string hamster to yourself. Right? And now you can, now you can plug that into your pseudo-random number generator, and you get a stream of bytes. And those bytes are going to actually with your real data and exchange conversations. And on the other side, you're going to do the same thing. Bob also knows the string hamster. He never told anybody about it, except the fridge. And uh, uh, he's going to plug it into the same pseudo-random generator, which is just a C program on his computer, or on his wireless device. And you're going to get the same stream side attacks. When you extra things together, you anchor the computer. He's going to Transmit the ciphertext XOR with the data you want to actually say. Oh, okay. Yes. Make sense? Great, okay. So stay tuned. Okay, so Derp, we go back to the original one. Same of the key, same author. That's as far as we're going to go today. Happy Halloween, happy midterm. See you next Monday. Great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I have office hours now, one to two, if anybody wants to chat about ciphertypes or get more candy.